Here to speak is Yvonne Lamb, uh, building bento boxes. Yvonne works on the release engineering side of the engineering services group at Chef Software. She deals with packaging, artifact management, and documentation, as well as running after new platforms and badly behaved build machines. She lives in Seattle in a house with many cats, many books, and many machines that change state unpredictably. Please, please help me welcome Yvonne to the stage. So that's me. So the many machines that change state in my house are the reason why I'm always a little skeptical when somebody shows up and says, we need this old platform, because I'm like, yeah, I have like, you know, pre-Solaris you know, pre Sun hardware in my garage too, and I would love it if Chef ran on that, but, you know, <laughs> you know it's, does my wanting it, <laughs> you know, make it go? Well, not so much. So anyways, I feel like I'm giving the world's most old-fashioned talk here, so this is a very appropriate venue for that, and I'm going to talk about things like platforms and pipelines. So a little bit about me. Um, I'm Yvonne, hi. There are a bunch of places where you can find me. I work in the engineering services group at Chef, which is a group with sort of dual functions. There's a process function, and then there is um, sort of release engineering stuff, and I'm on the release engineering side. Um, if you know my name, it's probably because I'm a maintainer on the Omnibus cookbook. Omnibus is our build tool. Um, I'm a maintainer on Bento, which I'm going to talk about, and I work on various sort of release engineering related cookbooks like Artifactory, Jenkins, stuff like that. So, and mostly, and so somebody was saying, oh, you know, release engineering, that's sort of old fashioned. Um, like, like it's all DevOps now, and it's like, well, when you deal with some of our platforms, release engineer is kind of the right word. Um, so I should say a little bit about what we do. Um, we work on build infrastructure, um, so that's why the omnibus and the cookbooks, and we manage um, CI and CD clusters, and um, we sort of have, we have a role in bringing new platforms up in, the, in those environments. So what is Bento? Um, I'm expecting most people know this, but quickly, in case you don't, it is not an adorable little container with tasty treats in it. It's like, in, in, for us, it's reasonable packer templates um, and or minimal vagrant boxes built from those templates. Um, we make them public where we can. Some of them we can't because they're proprietary, proprietary or otherwise have other licensing constraints. Um, there's a GitHub repo with the, with the templates in it. And Bento's big design goal is minimal vagrant boxes. This is really what distinguishes Bento from other similar products or projects like Box Cutter, say, which, um, you know, like they tend to want to more, install more stuff. They have an ethos around having a bit richer environment. We're very much about, nope, it's, it's a very bare bones install. And we're going to assume that you, the user, are going to provision it the way you want it provisioned. Um, and that's sort of part of the, part of the Bento thing. So the story so far. So Bento is a pretty old project. I mean, in sort of term, it, like it's been around for some time. And I sort of came in kind of in the middle where, yeah, so it, it does have that tied to the railroad tracks feeling a little bit. Um, but anyway, so Bento started out as a bunch of BWI templates. Um, they were dried up by Tim Dysinger so that to make them reusable. And then later it, they turned into a bunch of Packer templates. Um, and then there have always been manually built boxes in a public S3 bucket. Um, so the problem with those boxes was that they were not built by an automatic process. They were built manually by a series of people. And in the grand scheme of things, um, building boxes is not the most exciting thing in the world. It is not fun. And then people would get tired of it or they'd want their laptop back for other uses. And they'd be like, well, I'm not doing that anymore. And then they'd put it down. And then somebody else would be like, but this is really important to our community. It's really important to, um, like even to our development workflow. So I'm gonna pick it up and start doing it. And then the whole cycle would start again. Um, like the last person sort of in this chain before the release engineering took it on a little bit was somebody who, well, he's Julian Dunn, who um, at the time was doing a lot of traveling and spending a lot of time on crappy hotel Wi-Fi and crappy airplane Wi-Fi, and we were at the same conference together, and I was wondering why the Wi-Fi was so bad, and he was just like, oh, that was me. I was, sorry, I was downloading new ISO images. So I, you know, that was just like, okay, we, we're, we're taking this away from you. Um, and then, what, so what happened was, that, you know, it sort of languished in the state for a while, where um, 
people would build boxes because they, were th they thought they were important, but there was never sort of an automatic build system for this. And the builds were very ad hoc, and when somebody had time or was in a good circumstance to do it. And, you know, and in the grand scheme of things, it just wasn't, it wasn't a priority. And then, so then the release engineering team was formed at Chef, which was a couple of years ago. Um, that's about when I joined. So release engineering at Chef. We have a machine, we have lots of gears, that's us. Um, what we do, so we actually build and run the machine that engineers use to release product. We do not release products. I don't, I mean, like, I know you don't care, but I feel like I say this, like, once on average of once a week to people at Chef that it's like, no, really, if you wanna, uh, wanna release a such and such, you need to go and talk to, that, talk to the team for that because we can't just hit the button. I mean, we could, but teams have their own schedule and their own things, and yeah, it wouldn't, it wouldn't go over well. Um, we automate very aggressively. Like, every, like, we manage everything in Chef, which you would expect. We write a lot of Ruby. Um, we, pr we try to provide clean APIs and interfaces whenever we can. Um, and we also deal with a lot of platforms. Um, the, yeah, it's, it's a thing, platforms. <laughs> so, Chef supplies packages for 50-ish OS and version combinations. When I was doing this talk, I, I originally had that at 25, and Joshua Timberman came by and said, it's not 25, you're forgetting about 32-bit, aren't you? And I was like, yeah, I wish I could forget about 32-bit, but you're absolutely right, it, so it is 50-ish. It is and we need a local dev environment for each platform, for a bunch of things, like one of them is just to do the, dev do the development work that is involved in bringing in a new platform. Um, one of it, one reason, another reason is to debug the platform-specific build issues, which, you know, they just sort of come up in the, in the normal way of things as people add new features that depend on things that might not be quite the same depending on what your platform is. And just to support faster iteration because having people try to debug some of this stuff in the CI environment itself, um, it just causes problems. I mean, like, we have a lot of platforms. Some of them are slow. Bills can stack up. People don't get their feedback in time. It makes, it makes everybody cranky. And I know I'm going to slip and talk about the weird platforms, so I thought I would just get that right out there. Um, and weird in this context is not derogatory. It's just, it's sort of the term of art that I tend to use to de describe platforms that are some combination of proprietary, um, old, and far away from a modern Linux. So in some contexts, FreeBSD is a weird platform. Sorry, FreeBSD people, I like it too. But you know, sometimes it is because it's like, yeah, you don't do things the way that other platforms do. And you know, like we have a workflow that's built a certain way, and so we need to expand it to, to encompass that. So how we bring in a new platform is kind of an adventure. Um, the first thing that we tend to do, so I talked a little bit about how we are very focused on interfaces. And that's because ideally our hope is that once we bring in a plat, once a platform is brought in, we don't necessarily want to own the build on that platform forever, right? Like we don't want to be the people that um, have to fix every bug that happens on some platform or whatever. Like, you know, we would really like that to be a task that's spread out over and among the development teams as well. So we try to use Test Kitchen as the interface for interacting with these machines. Um, but sort of the, the, the general outline is the first thing that we do is we try to build a disposable machine for iteration. Um, ideally, this is a Vagrant box. Sometimes we can't do that. We do have um, Sol 10 in our build farm. We also have AIX in our build farm. So and on those, we basically wrote interfaces so that you, know, so that you can use Kitchen, you know, Kitchen Converge, um, you know, Kitchen Verify, the same way that you could if you were on a Vagrant box with a, with a Linux guest. Um, so the next thing we do is we build a throwaway version of Chef that is called Angry Chef. So some of you may have seen the Angry Chef um, test kitchen entries for in some of the um, omnibus projects, and that's what that is. It's the thing that you build so that you can build Chef in the right location in the right way. Um, and then 
The throwaway version of Chef we use to set up an Omnibus environment. Um, Omnibus is our build tool, as I said. And then we use that to set up a C environment to build a real version of Chef. It is very inception -y. Um, like if you, so there's sort of this, I had to throw this slide in here because I love it. Um, in very early English cookbooks, the recipes would be things like, well, first go catch your rabbit. And that to me is what adding a new platform um, to our build farm sometimes feels like. It's like, well, okay, let's go and find, find the rabbit. <laughs> um, so, but the, the, the important thing is like the, the critical step here is like we need a box. We need a thing that we can do all this development work and all this bootstrapping on. And so that's sort of why Bento for us is an important thing. And well, we sort of ran into some problems because even though rebuilding boxes with Packer is easy and the community involved in Packer is, or involved in the Bento project is very active in trying to keep the templates and the scripts and all of that stuff up to date, um, we weren't doing the rebuilds regularly and consistently, and this caused problems. Um, like, it caused problems with like support for the Omnibus cookbook, where we would just, where somebody would be like, oh, well, the, you know, that, that it's like, I, we, like, I wanna add this new thing, and it's like, okay, go do it, and they'd be like, is that really the right, ver no, it's not, because there would be some combination of drift in the cookbook, and drift in the platform, and all of that, and just, you know, just you know, bringing up the test kitchen environment was, was challenging. The other thing, and this is really kind of where I came in, is that um, all of the omnibus projects that we do have a test kitchen build lab. And those all have like all the platforms in them and all of that. And you know, it's supposed to be this environment that developers can use um, to say debug, you know, debug, prob debug build problems on some platform. And the fact that those were not up to date, you know, people would show up and they'd be like, oh, so FreeBSD is having this problem. Um, and, you know, in the build farm, and I'd be like, so did you bring up the box? And they'd be like, well, I tried. It's like, yeah, okay, okay. Um, so, you know, you've probably heard people talk about hate driven development. Um, I don't really have, I don't really do that. Like, if I hate something, I just want to go away and, like, not deal with it. But I do practice sort of let us never speak of this again development where it's like, I'm tired of explaining this. I'm tired of, you know, I'm tired of sort of the embarrassment level of, yeah, it should really be smoother than this, but it's not. So I do get to the point where it's like, okay, I just want this to go away and I don't want to have to talk about it or explain it. I just want it to be a utility. So that was sort of where we were. Um, you know, we'd sort of spent like a year getting to that point and that was kind of where we were last September. Then a couple of other needs came along um, outside of release engineering. One of them was that Fletcher Nickel, um, who is the owner of Test Kitchen and does a lot of other cool products in the project ugh, projects in the Chef ecosystem, um, he really wanted to do a test-driven infrastructure project to test um, cookbooks on master of all of the things. So. Chef, Test Kitchen, whatever the platform is, Vagrant. And so in order to do that, he would need, like, need to know that, be able to trust that, yes, his bento box is up to date and there isn't some weird you know, change in packages such that something that used to work doesn't work anymore. Um, Seth Thomas, Cheese Plus, was also, at the time, he, at the time he was doing a lot of work with, um, well, so he was working for Partner Engineering. And so he was helping Part, helping our partners solve their problems and stuff like that. And, you know, he really wanted them to have up-to-date bento boxes as well. So he really cared. And then there was also sort of a movement in the company at large for testing chef client against cookbooks on critical platforms because, like, we know that people don't love the thing where we release a new version of Chef and then it breaks all the cookbooks. Like, we don't love that either. We just kind of want that to go away. Um, but anyway, so we ended up forming a semi-informal cross-functional team to do this, and we just kind of did it. Um, and it was interesting, you know, I'm gonna talk about that because, it's a, because I think it's interesting. So how we work, um, we sort of acknowledge that getting the bento builds fully automated is a side project for each of us. And that is because even though it's important, it's not, um, 
let's see if I can say that, I'm trying to find the right words for this. You know, it's important, but it's not more compelling than any of the other, you know, 15 stories that anybody could be working on, um, you know, like bringing on new platforms or, you know, or simplifying other environments or doing other things. So it's like, you know, it's important, it's at the base, it's at the bottom of a lot of things, but people were getting along okay, even though we didn't have up-to-date boxes all the time because, like I said, the Bento community does do a pretty good job of keeping the templates and stuff up-to-date. So it's like, well, if you want a new box, and you know, Packer makes it really easy, you can just go and build a new box. And, you know, and that was nice, but having, having shared boxes, it was clear that it was a win. Um, we expect discontinuous progress because you know, it's in the nature of things. It's a side project for each of us. And we, ha we have a stand-up once a week or so, I mean, depending on travel schedules, whatever, just to keep, just to keep reminding us that we're doing this. Um, so when I say all those things, the part of my brain that in, is involved in, man, in managing projects just sort of is like, just wants to have the vapors because this is totally the opposite of how most projects are run and how most people tell you that you want to run projects. Um, but it has worked for us on this one for a couple of reasons. Um, one of them is that nobody was really in a hurry for a bento box build pipeline. So it was one of those things where it's like, yeah, it's nice that you know, we're making progress towards something that we all agree is something should be done, even if it's not important enough for us to like, just swarm and do it all in you know, the next 10 minutes or whatever. Um, the other thing, another thing was that it was work that we could do in the time that we had. Like a lot of it was work that we could do in spare moments or moments of, I'm really tired of looking at this thing that I'm looking at, I know I can, you know, I can spend a little bit of time writing the build cookbook for Bento, or I can spend time improving the Bento, the Bento build scripts. Um, and you know, like I've been saying, it's work that everybody agreed was useful, um, but not urgent. And so people were kind of okay with us taking a small amount of time as a side project to try to improve things. So we spent a lot of time figuring out what our goals were for RV1. Um, so they were, we wanted build nodes, um, OSX ones, and I'm going to go into that. We wanted them to be managed by Chef. We wanted the ability for Git to kick builds on merge to master. And we wanted really fine grained versioning. And the last one is a little bit weird, so I'm gonna talk about that too. We had intentions as well as goals, which, so in my mind, an intention is something where it's like you, you know, it's not exactly something that you can work toward. It, it, I mean, it's not a, okay, we got here, we're done. It's, it's more like it's something that you work toward. It's something that you have in the back of your mind as you are, you know, making your way through this, through this work process. And so kind of our intentions were we wanted to have the same experience for, um, for the straightforward platforms for like the modern Linuxes that we did for the more esoteric platforms, like as much as we possibly could. And that's because one of the things, and people here who deal with a lot of platforms will know this, is that you, you always have this set of trade-offs to make between do you do the cool new thing that's supported in the new platform that your old platforms don't do, or do you stick with the set of functionality that's supported by the old platform and just do that? And there, there is a, it's a, it's a trade-off. There isn't a right answer here, right? Because it's like if you, if you stick to the old way of doing things, you never make progress. You never, you know, you're never bringing anything new in. If you only do the new stuff, then, you know, the old platforms, they, they sort, you know, which might be really important for business reasons, they just kind of become this exceptional case and it be, they become harder to work with, they become harder to maintain. You know, there's just, it's just sort of the start of a slippery slope. So yeah, we wanted to keep the, the experience as much the same as we could. Um, we wanted to improve quality in both in the build process. I mean, like one of the things that I think is frustrating for a lot of people, I mean, it's frustrating for us too, is you know, you get a new bento box, you install it, you, you bring it up and then it's like, oh, um, yeah, I don't have everything I need to actually like do the thing that you want so then you have to spend a bunch of time figuring out like, how, like, okay, what is it that I have to do to bring the box up to speed with, to a point where like I can just provision it with the stuff that I, that I already knew that I had to get on there. 
Um, and in some places, you know, like we knew that it wasn't going to be possible to improve quality directly in some cases. So what we wanted to improve on was our ability to rebuild. So that it's like, okay, if there's a bug, it, 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 you know, if there's a bug in the box build, then we just, we, we crank out a bunch of new ones. And yeah, people will have to download new boxes and that's inconvenient, but at least they'll have a fixed box. So that's kind of, that's what we wanted to do. Um, so people, a bunch of people have asked me like why local builds instead of Atlas because Atlas came out during all of this. And when Atlas came out, I was like, yeah, I really, really want to use Atlas. But we didn't really have a huge compelling reason not to use Atlas, but we had a combination of factors. One of them is the, the proprietary stuff, um, which it's like, it's just harder to do on that kind of platform. We already had some existing OSX hardware in house that we could use for virtualization. Um, and because we were virtualizing a lot of different platforms, you know, that's, we, we really kind of wanted to, you know, OSX really did seem like the best bet for, for what we wanted to do if we wanted it all in one place. Um, we wanted to prototype build infrastructure that we were thinking of for other projects because, so we have a lot of CI at Chef um, and that's sort of the reason for the last one for minimizing the number of C environments because that was me. I, I mean, I get tired of having the conversation all the time where it's like, uh, did you check the CI cluster? Um, yes, I did. It's like, wait, which CI cluster did you check? Which other CI cluster? It's like, no, it's the other CI cluster. Or no, it, or you know, it's this other kind of CI. And so we really wanted to, so in that sense, you know, like we have nothing against having multiple different kinds of build infrastructure at Chef, and so we wanted to prototype those. We wanted, you know, like we have a project in mind for what I did with the Bento pipelines, or you know, what Seth and Fletcher and I did with the Bento pipelines. But we also wanted to minimize the number of CI environments, and I sort of did, I, it, that was really me. I sort of didn't want to have to keep saying, well, the Windows boxes are built over here on these Macs, and everything else is built over, you know, over in this other place. Um, you know, that, that, was the, that was the thinking at the time. We've, we've done a bunch of revisiting. So how are we doing? Well, we are building on OSX nodes managed by Chef. Um, we are running on scrounged hardware in an, in an unorthodox location in the grand tradition of all, um, of many release engineering projects. But, you know, it's, we are at least building on a consistent set of nodes with a consistent set of tools. Um, we can trigger builds on merge to master. I mean, we, we're, I don't think we're doing that all the time, but it's a thing that we can do and it's a thing we can turn on easily. Um, so Michael, who I just met before lunch, um, was, it works for Parallels and he was very kind and helpful in getting us Parallels licenses. So we are now building Bento boxes for Parallels as well as VirtualBox and VMware. We also, um, we have Kimu support in there, but we don't build for that. That was because there was somebody else who really, really wanted it, and so we kind of merged it blind. Um, you know, maybe someday, but not now. And we have lots and lots of fine-grained version information. Um, what did what did we? Yeah, this was sort of this was sort of an interesting one because for the version metadata. So why did we care so much about it? Like, why am I going on about this? Well, the reason is it's really about debugging. Um, it turns out while we were working on this, what we found out is that, and this might not be everybody's use case, but it was really ours, that we are people who have a lot of um, very similarly named vagrant boxes that have all been built in slightly different ways or with slightly different parameters sitting around. And it just, you know, for debugging other kinds of problems. So it's like, well, what if they were on CentOS 6.5 instead of 6.6 or whatever, but everything is sort of named something similar. And, you know, and it's like, and did I make any changes in my tree when I built this? So we really kind of wanted to have like more explicit version information. The other thing is that for Test Kitchen, there are all kinds of bugs that get filed against you know, I have this box and I, brought, and I brought this thing up and my stuff didn't work. And it's like, sometimes it's really useful to have um, data in a very explicit place about how the box was built. And so where is this mysterious version metadata? So when you build with our, with our um, Bento script, it, the version, it's like, there's a lot of it and it goes to three places. It goes into the box name, 
um, it goes into a metadata.json file on your local disk and it, on the, yeah, on the build machine. And it also gets put on the bento box itself in Etsy bento metadata.json. So it's available there for debugging should you want it. Um, and the, the metadata that we put in there is, we were pretty generous with it and there's actually more stuff that we want in there. Um, but we put in the name of the Packer template, we put in the version including a timestamp. Um, our version numbers are sort of summer-ish, but they're not really, key. I mean like we want the timestamp in there because that's sort of the most granular level of data that we can get. Um, the git ref and the state of your look of the git branch on which the build was done. So you'll see dirty or clean in there. So just saying, you know, do you have any outstanding commits in, in, the, in the branch of Bento that was used to do this? And the provider. And there's like, there's more that we want to get in there somewhere. Hopefully not in the box name, but somewhere. Um, and what we relearned along the way and that was, that was kind of interesting. So one thing that we learned that we were sort of surprised by, so when we, when we wrote the bento script, we learned we were generating the name of the box from, um, from a bunch of stuff in there to keep the box name from getting too long. And it turned out that some people were consuming the templates, but they were not consuming the built boxes. Like we were so focused on rebuilding boxes that we just kind of forgot that there might be people, people out there using templates and they weren't so happy that um, their boxes all end up na getting some, named something like under unset, under template name, under um, git, under vert, yeah, just like they weren't happy about that. So we changed that back. Um, another thing that we learned was that getting real hardware has a lot of overhead involved. Um, you know, like getting real hardware, getting it installed in the right place, like especially when that's not really it's not really a core competency of our team. It's not, there are people who do that, but you know, we need to get their time. And then that means that there needs to be a certain amount of agreement that this is important. And you know, which like, these are all things that can be worked out, but that's why we're running on a set of boxes in an unorthodox and secret location. Um, the space of versions where everything works feels really, really small. So we get a lot of, Okay, so the new box works for me on this platform, but it doesn't work for me on this other platform. And it's just like, it's trying to get everything lined up right. So, so, that, this, so that you want the Packer version, um, the, you know, whether you're using VMware or VirtualBox or Parallels, and what version of that was that? What version of Vagrant are we testing on? What version of Vagrant are the users using? The version of all of the plugins, um, all of that is just like that stuff that we would like to get into the metadata more because it's turned out that, yeah, it makes a difference. Um, you know, like we don't always want it to, but it does. And the particular bane of my existence is the install of the VMware tools. Like we're getting better. We just merged to PR to always do the force install to make them install, but that's been a thing that is challenging. Um, and I know that I, as a person, I always get kind of cranky where it's like, I bring up the box and it's like, like you don't have the, you don't have the VMware tools installed, right? You can't do anything. And it's like, you're going to make me open up a UI and click on stuff to install those. These aren't you. And yeah, they, they do. So, but hopefully that is something that we are getting better at so that fewer people will encounter that and fewer people will be as whiny as I am about um, opening, opening UIs and clicking on things. So, where are we going? Um, well, Windows Packer templates, that's another one in the, okay, let us never speak of this again. I mean, I understand people want them. Like we have a lot of uses for them internally. Um, they, just, they just haven't happened because, well, I'm not really a Windows person and I'm hoping to get Matt Rock to do this. Otherwise, it'll just be cargo culted from something else because that's kind of the way that I roll. Um, so Matt has also talked about wanting to do Hyper-V as well, so having Hyper-V versions of the boxes would be awesome. And we would really like to start seeing the output of the Bento pipeline automatically consumed by other testing pipelines. So I originally got into this because it's like, gee, wouldn't it be nice if we had a process to keep um, the Omnibus build labs up to date so that whenever somebody needs to go and say, you know, whenever somebody needs to bring up 
you know, some platform and to, to debug some issue that's only happening on that platform. Like, it's just ready for them. It's not a, oh, I'll get to that some of these days while the build breaks and the build breaks and the build breaks. Um, so a thing I should say about that is that one of our rules is that if it's in our CI, if it's a platform in CI and the build fails on that, it stops all the builds. We do not upload artifacts for anybody else. We do not release um, on some platforms and not others. It's like, if we're building it, it's a first class platform. And if the build fails, you know, yeah, you gotta fix it until, you know, you have to fix it or nothing is moving forward. So obviously there's interest in having like nice clean platform support for across all platforms and just having it be current and having it be up to date. I would really like that. Um, we're also reconsidering builds in Atlas. Um, and you're probably wondering why after I gave you that big long explanation about why we didn't go with Atlas in the first place. And the reason is hardware. <laughs> Um, that it would be nice to that it would be nice to re redistribute some of the builds that we can do in Atlas to Atlas and just take the overhead of having um, build pipelines in two different places. So that's pretty much it. Um, I can take questions if you have any. If not, then you know nobody ever complains that talks are too short. So. So uh, I'm a Packer maintainer, and so I'm really excited about this. Um, question I have for you is, with the hardware that you've used, where do you get the best sort of results? Like if I wanted to get a physical piece of hardware to do this, because doing it in like vert, nested vert is kind of tricky. Mm -hmm. um, what's worked well for you? Um, so I don't know about well, but OSX, a modern version of OSX with um, a nice big fat SSD has been the main thing that we've that has really sped up, that has really helped us to speed up with that the we would like to use um you know and we're built we're just we're building on metal right now i mean that is it's sort of the fastest thing it was sort of you know like that might change going forward but you know we've been happy with a modern osx with a modern with a modern disk drive or a not disk drive but you know the not spinny thing, and the uh, and the disc actually makes a huge difference. That one of the boxes that we scrounged had um, a regular drive in it, and the it was it was very 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 the build times were horrible, um, and I was really spending a lot of time like just worrying about it. it's like how do we slow down the rest of the builds to compensate for this one machine, um, and the answer is well. We, Seth Thomas did a bunch of moving things around to sort of like get the most use out of the hardware that we could get. And, you know, that was kind of it. Other questions? Hi. Uh, Packer templates are overlapping. So do you update all of them manually or did you consider using some, like uh, generating them dynamically from some templates? I'm sorry, I missed the first part of your question. Okay, so uh, in every Packer, uh, Packer configuration file, you have a lot of the, uh, the same, uh, yeah. s same parts. So did you consider uh, uh, generate them dynamically from like, templates? Um, so we have, so it's sort of yes and, um, yes and no. I mean, we do, so this is all generated by the Bento script. So, um, and it is, and it is very automated. The, so the, so there's, there's a little bit of trickiness in here that has to do with, um, so the, originally the way that I wrote this, that I wrote the, build, the, the, first, um, the first build pipeline, everything was very granular to, um, to the check-in. Like, and so, and I wanted, and, and this is because I wanted to have the same set of versions across all of the boxes built from a single Git merge. Um, that turned out not to be practical because of, like that did not give us the best use of our, use of our hardware. And it did not give us, um, it, and it also didn't give us the best way to sort of divide up the build and split and split it out for split out build stages for later. So what we ended up doing 
um, is that this is, that, like you're right, there's a lot of repetition in the data, but what you will find is that the timestamp is the timestamp of when that particular build starts. So it's not the timestamp of the entire build process. And so that's sort of how, that, you know, so, so yes, so, you know, so it is repeated, but it's not quite as repeated as it looks. Does that make sense? Does, does that answer your question? Yeah. Hi, Juan. Hi. Thanks for your talk and for your work on Bento. Um, I've used Bento a bit in, in the past and uh, found it to be very good and not really have any problems. The things that are hard about managing VMs I found were to be differences between uh, VirtualBox, VMware Fusion, and different versions of those programs. Mm -hmm. um, I'm sure this is something you're quite familiar with. And in particular, I found that VirtualBox is not great. So if you want better performance, VMware Fusion or probably Parallels does a lot better. Um, but they tend to break projects like this every time they upgrade, which is basically every year. So I you know, leave VM projects aside for a few months, come back to it. VMware has released a new major version that breaks everything that came before it. Mm -hmm. um, I'm wondering if you could tell us a little bit about, on your side of the wall, sort of your experiences with trying to maintain these templates that supposedly will continue to work with a particular vendor's software, mm -hmm. but have to maintain these sort of version compatibility jumps. We swear a lot. <laughs> um, sure. Like I don't, I don't like it. That, like that, like that is a thing that we've actually worried about quite a bit with the build pipelines the way they are. Because when somebody was building them manually, like it was a pain in the butt for them, right, to try different versions to try to like enlarge the space of working platforms. Um, but it didn't really affect anything else. And now that there's a build pipeline, and now that the boxes are managed, it, there's there's more effect. And so we've t we've talked about this and. I think what we're going to try to do is we're going to try to surf the bleeding edge on the grounds of that is where fixes come in. That's the stuff that's most likely to be fixed. We might revert, um, but it would have to be, like I don't want to throw out, the, I don't want to say we will never revert, we will always move forward, but I could say that there could be a compelling reason of you know that version of VirtualBox or whatever is just not happy with a lot of things and you know, we really can't move forward to it until, you know, until it's better, you know, until they fix that stuff. Um, unfortunately, I, you know, it's like, yeah, it's the same crappy answer that everybody else has, which is that, you know, we, you know, it's like somebody has to try it and see it. So for us, there's sort of this question of when we update, um, you know, like, do we just sort of jump on it right away and um, try to use, you know, our contacts and, our influence with other projects to say, okay, we need you to fix your stuff, or do we wait and see, you know, and give a better experience for our users? I mean, the other thing is that because it is an open source project, a lot of the a lot of the maintaining of the templates really um, falls to individual users and individual communities who are really passionate about that particular platform for some reason, and so they they tend to do a really good job of vetting a lot of the stuff for us up front. Um, other questions? Oh, sure. Can I can also be loud. That's easier. Loud is great. All right. Uh, let's say we want to get involved with this and contribute to it. Do we need to work for Shaft to be a part of that process? Oh, hell no. Um, <laughs> so we have a project. We have, um, it's the Chef Bento project. Chef, chef slash Bento on GitHub. Um, you, I don't think you even need to sign a CLA the way you would for other chef projects. Like, I don't think that we are under review by Curry. Um, I might be lying, so don't hold it against me if I am, but um, signing the CLA is usually not a big deal for people, and it comes in handy for a lot of other parts of the ecosystem. So yeah, and you know, we, we, you know, we like contributors. We like people who, um, you know, we like people who care passionately about a platform and want it to work. Um, with Packer and Vagrant and in this particular environment. So definitely we, you know, it's like, please contribute. Anything else? Okay then, that's it. Thank you very much.